And for more on that, we are now joined by Harish Salve, Senior Supreme Court Advocate. Thank you very much, Mr. Salve, for joining us. Sir, tell us, you know, the significance of this development, because this will kick in from the 1st of April 2017, and GAR was also going to be implemented from April 2017. So in that sense, you know, investors were already expecting that something was going to happen. So in that context, how do you see today's announcement, sir? So happy this has come about. There was... Uh, uh, a serious concern about the way the Mauritius Treaty was being used by Indians to get past capital gains. Secondly, uh, if, if India is truly, if India is going to be totally global, why should an Indian entrepreneur be subject to a tax which a foreign investor is not subject to? For a foreign investor, I think what is important is certainty and clarity rather than this kind of a knee-jerk reaction which comes in PILs, through courts, through creative interpretation by the tax department. As long as there is clarity and precision, they know this is the price of entry, that is the price of exit, and I think this will put to bed a long-standing problem. Salve, um, do you expect uh, any serious or significant shifting of investment flows because the renegotiation with Mauritius is done. The government has also told us today that the renegotiation of the Singapore Treaty will happen. And uh, once we, we move towards the GAR regime and, of course, uh, the BIPS project as well internationally, are you expecting a serious shift in terms of the way money is coming into the Indian market? See, uh, let us, let's, let's, get real about some things. The world is a different place in 2016 and going forward as it was 10 years back. Transparency, clarity, uh, a, a new social understanding of tax planning. I mean, if, if in the developed world which where tax planning was born, if people say we're not going to drink Starbucks coffee, or we're not going to use Amazon because they don't pay fair tax, you see, income tax today has become a different social issue. So I think I'm, ha I'm, I'm personally, I'm happy the government has done this. There was always this air of, uh, of suspicion hanging around the Mauritius investment. If the government has put in a limitation of benefits clause, which I believe they have, and which should be there, and if the government has said, all right, we, we keep to ourselves the right to tax capital gains, I think in the, in the long run it's sensible. You see, foreign, Salve, investors, but how does, how, foreign investors right. want mm -hmm. clarity, mm -hmm. precision, and certainty. Right. Right. Absolutely, sir. Uh, you know, it's interesting, like, this announcement comes on a day when the government also uh, uh, sort of indicated the amount of indirect tax evasion that takes place in India. And they have amounted, you know, they've quoted an amount of 50,000 uh, crore rupees and an undisclosed income of 21,000 crore rupees in the last two years. So purely from the perspective of black money, sir, how do you see today's, you know, today's announcement uh, uh, you know, playing a role. You know, I, I think uh, uh, in India, we people are uh, living in a living in a sense of denial. You want to ask me where black money is? Go on to the next door office and find out how much was paid in white and how much was paid in black to buy the property. I think if you see, and I'm so happy, Governor uh, of the Reserve Bank the other day, Mr. Raghuram Rajan said. Stop wasting your time searching Swiss banks first. Get hold of the real estate uh, black money. I'm so happy government has introduced a marginal notional excise duty on jewelry. So that's another huge area of black money. I think if you start worrying about these areas instead of piffling amounts like 20,000 crores and 50,000 crores, I think we'll be much wiser. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. Point well taken. Thank you so very much, sir, for joining us here on India Business South. And for more on that, we're now joined by Vipul Javeri of Deloitte Haskins and Cells. Sudhir Kapadia also joins us from ENY. And of course, well known tax expert Dinesh Kanabar is also joining us from Mumbai. Let me come to you first, Mr. Kanabar. You know, the. Uh, the uh, you had Mr. Shakti Kanta Das saying that he expects investors to take a very measured uh, view of today's announcement. Considering the fact that the government has said that this is only going to kick in from April 2017, and again from April 2017 to April 2019, uh, uh, you know, there is again going to be an additional benefit that tax will be half of what it should be. So in that sense, you think the government has given ample time now to investors to actually digest today's announcement? Uh, 
I, I would think so. So let's just step back and see what's happened out here. First, the India-Mauritius Treaty renegotiation. The talks have happened at least about a dozen odd times and never reach a conclusion. For the first time, the government has been able to take something to a logical conclusion and enter into a protocol, number one. Number two, the protocol is entered a year before the scheduled date. Normally, one finds that most announcements happen somewhere close to the last date. Here, we have got a year ahead of time. Number three, we have a transition mechanism, which is a very measured mechanism. You have grandfathering of all the gains that happen in respect of investments made up to 31st March 17. So those investments, whenever wound up over years, uh, will not be liable to tax. Investments made for the two years thereafter being liable to a 50% tax provided uh, uh, the limitation of benefit clauses are, are, are satisfied and then a full tax regime. There can't be a more smoother transition and a more transparent way of achieving certainty. Today, why the tax treaty exists, practically one knows that it's very difficult, for example, to do transactions where the seller is a Mauritius entity because one needs to give reps, warranties. There is never a certainty whether the tax office is really in fact going to allow you a tax treaty benefit or not despite a supreme court judgment despite a cbdt circular so this is absolutely a very very welcome step all right mr kapadia let me get you in on this on in fact the limitation of benefits i mean basically that's the description that's what i guess gives teeth to this treaty in order to determine whether an entity is just a post box or whether it's a genuine entity and uh, i'll just read out for the benefit of viewers as well i mean a resident is deemed to be a shell or a conduit company if the total <coughs> expenditure on operations in mauritius is less than 27 lakh rupees uh, how do you view the limitation of benefits that have been put in place uh, to offer the 50 percent con concessional rate well the on the specific question question on LOB, it is just a proxy for uh, economic or commercial substance. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of economic or commercial substance is normally a very subjective concept. Uh, what can be economic substance for the taxpayer uh, may not be enough for the tax collector. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you see the treaty with Singapore as well, it has prescribed its own uh, proxy, Absolutely. Uh, which is in sync with the regulations in Singapore for establishing these kind of companies. But does it offer absolute clarity now? Because as you said, I mean, it, it had been a gray area earlier, proving substance. But now with these very clear measures coming in, the re reworked treaty, does it take away right. some of it, that? It, it's, of course, it's better than not having any uh, clarification. But we have to remember that for these two years, and you raised an interesting question, the whole uh, uh, commentary today has been, of course, on the bigger issue of the gains tax going away altogether. What happens is we will have the general anti-avoidance rule kicking in mm -hmm. from April 1, 2017, as we know. Uh, so far, the government has held on to its view that the general anti-avoidance rule will prevail over any kind of uh, LOB provisions in the treaty or any kind of clarifications. Mm -hmm. What the taxpayers have been saying is that if you have an LOB rule and if I comply with the LOB rule, then don't apply the guard to me. But that's not what the government has accepted. So in the respect of those two years to gain the 50% concessional rate or to access the 50% concessional rate, one will still have to demonstrate a, a reasonable amount of economic or commercial substance. The LOB rule will help at least to, as I said, to serve as a benchmark or a proxy for that purpose. And I think right. one other point, if right. I can make to what uh, Dinesh was saying, you know, about... Uh, about reps and warranties and indemnities. Uh, one data point there is that a lot of these kind of indemnities and warranties in relation to transactions actually arise as well in context of indirect transfers. So I don't think you know that the need for these kind of arrangements will go away altogether because what we are right. discussing today is merely the amendment to the Mauritius India Treaty mm -hmm which deals with direct transfers of securities in India. Right, Mr. Javedi, please come in on that because, uh, uh, you know, what does this mean now for compliance cost of investors, uh, especially to prove that they are indeed a bona fide business and they have to show now that they have, you know, you, you know that they have made payments of 27 lakh rupees in a year. So purely from a compliance perspective, uh, uh, how do you view this? Is it, is it some sort of a setback, you would say, for the investors? or? Or do you think that this is, you know, this is perhaps a small price to pay for more clarity? Well, uh, absolutely, we are. without doubt, it's a small price to pay for uh, more clarity. 
again, uh, you know, uh, one would assume that the, the value and the volume of transactions would justify this kind of an expenditure. Otherwise, it might not uh, quite be worth, uh, you know, using a, a, a Mauritius kind of route to invest into India. But uh, you see, the important thing is uh, the, the expenditure is, has to be on their operations. And therefore, it's not just any kind of expenditure which has to be made. Uh, so in other words, it cannot be an expenditure which is uh, you know, paid to a, a, a sister company uh, for, for really no value of service uh, which is uh, justifiably required in that uh, uh, country. So uh, while expenditure is important, it must also have uh, a certain uh, economic activity carried out there. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kanabar, let me just go back to the point that uh, Mr. Kabaria was also making on the move towards GAR. Do you expect more tinkering or more changes in other, uh, uh, you know, treaties? Of course, we know that the uh, Singapore Treaty will be rejigged as well. But what happens to some of these LOB provisions, etc., when the GAR guidelines kick in? Will they, is your understanding that they will actually override a lot of the, the treaties and the sub-benefits that might be offered to a certain section of people under these treaties? So two points. First of all, even before we look at GAR, the OECD commission, what was a momentous BEPS project, the base erosion profit shifting project. And one of the avowed comments which OECD came out with was to say that while the purpose of tax treaties is to avoid double taxation, it is equally to avoid double non-taxation. So the world is now recognizing that tax treaties cannot be used as a measure of double non-taxation. Uh, insofar as the point which Sudhir made earlier, really uh, it's embedded in the law itself. The law itself provides that the provisions of general anti-avoidance regulation will override any tax treaty. Already the revenue officials have come back to say that they're going to renegotiate the treaty with Singapore and make it consistent with the provisions of the Mauritius tax treaty. And unless renegotiated, it will not be able to tax 50% of the gains and uh, thereafter tax everything from 19. So that renegotiation has to happen and a fresh protocol will need to be entered into between India and Singapore. Uh, equally, again, Cyprus is a treaty which offers certain benefits. There are other treaties which, which provide certain benefits. And again, there are many, many treaties where the beneficial ownership concept is there. And while that concept has always been around, uh, I think that concept will come again in scrutiny once GAR kicks in because the office, tax office is going to look at whether the beneficial ownership, whether it is for royalties or for other income, actually exists or does not exist. Sure, sure. Mr. Zaveri, your thoughts on this? I mean, this is probably the beginning of a re renegotiation of a lot of other treaties, as the point Mr. Kanabar is also making. So what should investors be prepared for? I mean, are we talking about absolute clarity in taxation of capital gains 2019 onwards? If you are investing into India, if you are uh, getting the capital gains on Indian securities, you've got to pay tax. It's a loud and clear message for 2019 onwards. I, I mean, clearly, that, that, uh, the, the entire BEPS project uh, focuses on that, which is to say that, you know, there can be no, avo uh, uh, no avoidance of tax. There has to be a complete disclosure on, uh, you know, various aspects of your business and uh, arrangements. And all the 15 articles really, if you put them into uh, uh, different buckets, they either talk about the avoidance or uh, disclosures. Now, uh, in that regard, now that is the new tax environment that we are actually getting into. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, it's a new uh, uh, tax world order, so as to say, uh, that we are getting into. Now, in that regard, uh, you see, whatever uh, clarity that can at all be possible, I think this is the best case scenario. So therefore, uh, you know, uh, the government right. has done what, uh, uh, what it needs to provide that clarity. Absolutely. Else, you know, GAR would have it's come. Uh, and uh, yeah. if this particular provision had not come, we would have uh, actually had a huge amount of uncertainty. And more, yes, and then exactly, and more uncertainty. Final word then to you, then uh, uh, Sudhir, because uh, what happens to participatory notes now? Will they become a thing of the past starting April 1st? 
2017 because currently 70 percent of the of the p notes originate from Mauritius and Singapore. So what happens to P notes post <coughs> April 1st, 2017? And uh, let me add a supplementary, Ron. What happens to overall investment? I mean, we've come a long way from the days when the market would tank, go down, uh, you know, lower circuit, just at the, the mention of the word P note, just at the mention of the word guard. We've come, come a long way from then. But uh, uh, beyond that, should we also be prepared for some volatility in, in the investment flows? Okay, so uh, I think two... <laughs> You're talking of investments and you're talking of promissory notes. Uh, see, the first point is that uh, any investment decision, as we all know, is, is predicated on the basis of a tax-adjusted rate of return. And I would add a tax and currency-adjusted rate of return when it comes to foreign investments. So the reality is that uh, what this means uh, going forward is that there will be definitely a higher hurdle rate which foreign investors will have to consider as far as investments in unlisted securities is concerned. So if you are a private equity fund or a venture capital fund, or of course, if you are a portfolio investor making short-term gains even in listed securities, you are now going to factor in a particular tax rate, the prevailing tax rate, and then figure out whether my investments in this country is worth it or not. And then, of course, the currency risk and the, and, and, and so all I'm saying is it's a, now going to be a tax-adjusted return. I think that's point number one. So whether it's a direct investment or through P-notes, that is the issue. Second is we have to, you know, uh, appreciate the fact that when it comes to making investments, investors also tend to look at the structure in a country with which they have comfort and fami familiarity with, sure. especially if they are offshore investors without any presence in a country. So I think, you know, intermediary structures per se don't go away uh, or wouldn't go away because they are not always meant to, you know, avoid tax. Mm -hmm. There are various other, you know, factors which go into structuring investments through an intermediary location mm -hmm. or intermediary structures. So that's, I think, the second point. And, you know, the third point is uh, what can be an interesting topic of debate, perhaps, or, 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 you know, an opportunity, I think, for a country like India, if it drives, at least to the extent possible, mm -hmm. uh, unlisted investments into becoming listed investments by sure. listing in Indian bourses. Okay. That can be a medium or long-term objective which the government may have in mind okay. uh, by introducing, A, this clarity and certainty and actually saying, guys, we are still giving you. Sure. Don't forget, long-term capital gains tax sure. on listed securities as per current laws is exempt. Well, there was a huge rumor just before the budget this year that that regime might change. It didn't happen <laughs> to the respite of a lot of people in this country. That didn't happen. We can't predict the future. But, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your viewpoints on this landmark renegotiation of the India-Mauritius Tax Treaty. We'll take